Welcome to the Discover Alaska Lecture Series, brought to you by the University of Alaska's Summer Sessions and Lifelong Learning. My name is Althea St. Martin, and I'll be your host for this summer series. Discover Alaska is in its 15th season and has been held on the UAF campus. The COVID-19 pandemic and social distancing guidelines required that we rethink the format for the series this summer. We are delighted that KUAC has agreed to support this new format as a weekly TV broadcast. Thank you, KUAC. Each Wednesday night over the course of the summer, KUAC will air a talk by a local community member on a range of Alaskan topics. We are grateful to our speakers who were incredibly flexible in adjusting to this new format and appreciate the time they are donating to help us all learn more about our great state. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I wanted to let you know that you can share and view the talks online later by going to UAF Summer Sessions website at uaf.edu backslash summer backslash events. I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speaker, Jeff Curry, who will be discussing climate change impacts on permafrost and Alaska's Department of Transportation and Public Facilities infrastructure. Warming temperatures are exacerbating permafrost-related damage to Alaska roads, airports, and buildings. We will hear about the impact to infrastructures, techniques for adapting to a warmer climate, and the challenges facing Alaska's Department of Transportation and Public Facilities. Jeff Curry has been working in, on, and underneath permafrost for nearly 30 years. He has been the Northern Region's material engineer for Alaska Department of Transportation and Public Facilities since 2011, supervising the region's drilling, engineering geology, and geotechnical engineering programs. He started his DOT career in 2000, including highway designer and materials engineer. He was Northern Region geotechnical engineer for six years prior to that. Jeff has also worked in the mining and mineral exploration industry in interior Alaska throughout the 1990s. We thank you, Jeff. We appreciate you sharing your expertise on climate change on the transportation infrastructure for Discover Alaska. Afternoon, everyone. Good evening, actually. I guess understand you'll be watching this on August 12th uh, in the evening, but we're recording this on June 5th in the afternoon. So a couple caveats that come with that. First of all, <clears throat> anything weird that happens between June 5th and August 12th that makes anything I say sound silly or, or, uh, or stupid is not my fault and I got no control over that. My crystal ball is pretty dusty. Um, the other thing that is that I normally give the presentations to folks live and I uh, enjoy having some interaction and asking some questions. So this is a little bit weird for me, but that's okay. We'll get through it here. I uh, work for the Department of Transportation and Public Facilities, D uh, DOT and PF, and uh, <clears throat> so I get to talk, get my little obligatory spiel about, about DOT first. Uh, our mission is to keep Alaska moving through service and infrastructure. A few fun facts about Alaska DOT. We uh, operate and maintain roads. We've got about 5,600 miles of roads, which May sound like a lot, but for a state the size of Alaska, it's really not. And most of our roads don't have very much redundancy. A lot of them are the only road to get where you want to get. Uh, unlike most DOTs, we have a lot of airports. We do airports. And we have something like 142 communities in the state that uh, rely on airports exclusively for their access. You'll hear me t use the term M&O a lot, the maintenance and operations folks. These are the guys and gals who are out uh, plowing snow, fixing potholes, clearing brush and whatnot, and among other things, fixing damage due to thawing permafrost. Um, we've got maintenance stations on our road system, and because these roads are so far flung, a lot of these, these stations are actually camps where uh, the operators live and, oper and, and stay for uh, shifts, doing shift work. <clears throat> Uh, PF and DOT and PF does not stand for permafrost. It's public facilities, which is to say buildings. We have something like 780 buildings that are actually DOT facilities. These are these maintenance and operation stations, the, office, uh, the offices that we're recording this in right now, uh, snow removal equipment buildings at these airports. But a few years back, uh, the state decided to make DOT and PF responsible for maintaining other state 
buildings as well are for our sister agencies. So uh, something like 80 of those buildings that we're maintaining now are other agencies. And the plan is to uh, have about 1,800 under our operation and, and uh, management by 20, end of 2021. Also, unlike most DOTs, we operate a ferry system. We have 35 terminals and 12 ferries, give or take, uh, not necessarily all operating at any given time. I have a, uh, we have harbors, and of course with the roads, we've got bridges and we've got commercial way stations. Uh, DOT is organizationally broken into three regions. The green area is our South Coast region, used to just be uh, southeast, but now uh, a few years back, they moved the uh, Kodiak, the Aleutians, and a little bit of the YK Delta into, combined it with southeast to make our south coast region. Kind of makes sense. It all has sort of the same character. Climato climatologically, they're all similar. Uh, very limited road system, highly reliant on the ferry system and then on airports. The lavender area is our southeast, is our, our central region. <clears throat> central region has most of the YK Delta, but uh, it also has the Kenai Peninsula, Anchorage, and uh, Matsu Valley. And so they tend to focus on big traffic, urban issues, uh, like I say, high traffic, uh, studded tire wear. Those are the, the problems that they have uh, primarily in central region. There is, <clears throat> everything else is northern region. Uh, Northern region is the largest, is more than half of the state by land mass and uh, has uh, bit over half of the roads, uh, most of the national highway system, most of the uh, interstate highway system. Yeah, we do have interstate highway system, give or, believe it or not. Uh, it's a classification even though we don't connect to any other state. And we have uh, more than half of the airports. Just so we're all on the same page, when we start this, let's, talk, let's do some definitions for permafrost. Permafrost is defined by a thermal condition. We define permafrost as ground that stays colder than 32 degrees continuously for at least two years. Now, two years is sort of arbitrary. Most of permafrost has been frozen for thousands of years. But uh, the point is, is that it doesn't ever get above 32 degrees. If it does, then it's not permafrost. Now the active layer is the ground that's above permafrost, and that's the that's the area that thaws in the summertime when the air is is warmer than uh, warmer than freezing, and thaws back or freezes back in the winter time. We frequently classify permafrost as whether it's thaw stable or thaw unstable. Uh, the fact that it's 31 degrees makes a big difference for some things, not for others. Take you know solid bedrock for example. You build a road on solid bedrock, it's 31 degrees. It warms up to 33 degrees. Nobody cares. <clears throat> Gra river gravel tends to be pretty stable, whether it's frozen or thawed. It's really f stable when it's frozen, but when it thaws, not much happens, and it's still a pretty good foundation for roads. Silt, on the other hand, in, in particular, ice-rich silt with excess water is what we call thaw unstable, and that's the problem actor. We'll be talking about that a lot more. We frequently distinguish between warm permafrost and cold permafrost, warm being really close to freezing, and that's the, the kind of permafrost we have around Fairbanks. It's uh, you know within a degree or so of freezing, and the takeaway there is if the, if the ground warms up a degree or two, boom, you got thawing permafrost. Whereas on the North Slope, for example, permafrost might be, say, 25 degrees. And if it warms up a couple degrees, okay, it's still pretty, still pretty cold and it's still pretty frozen. Uh, a couple things that, that irk some folks, including me. Permafrost is not the same thing as frosty. There's a lot of people who should know better but confuse these terms. <clears throat> permafrost is continuously frozen, right? Frost heave is, by, by definition, ground it freezes and for a number of reasons, heaves in the winter time and then settles back down in the springtime when it thaws. Well, if it's thaws, it's not permafrost, right? And then finally, we melt ice, we thaw permafrost. If you pull a chicken out of the freezer and put it on the counter, you're not melting out your, your chicken, right? You're thawing it out. <clears throat> this, uh, this diagram, this trumpet curve shows the temperature of the ground, the maximum and minimum temperatures in the ground with depth and uh, at, the, at, its, at the highest and lowest part of the year. 
uh, at the surface of the at the surf, ground surface, <clears throat> the air temperature goes from what in in Fairbanks maybe 40 below these days maybe maybe not uh, up to 80 degrees or 90 degrees in the summertime. Well, the surface of the ground pretty closely tracks the air temperature, and so. Uh, on, the, on the warmest or around the warmest day of the year, the surface of the ground is going to be pretty close to the air temperature. But as you go deeper, it doesn't get as warm. There's the specific heat of the ground, there's an insulating factor, and this may not happen at the same, in fact, it doesn't happen at the same time because it takes time for that heat from the summer to work its way down into the ground. That point where, uh, where the curve reaches the 32 degree Fahrenheit is probably in October, per, per, like, likely after things are starting to freeze a little bit, just because of that delay. But the takeaway here is, as, as you go deeper in the ground, the hottest temperature, warmest temperature the ground ever gets is less and less as you, uh, as, as you go deeper until, hey, once you get below that 32 degrees temperature, if it's 32 on the warmest day of the year, on the warmest day it ever gets, then it's more than 32 below the rest of the year, and so boom, now it's permafrost. <clears throat> uh, similarly, on the, on the cold end, the surf ground surface gets much colder than the typical surface in, at depth because it's exposed to uh, the air temperature in the middle of the winter time. And the deeper you go, the, the less cold the coldest day of the year is at that depth. As we descend deeper into the ground, those, those uh, extremes get closer and closer, and at some point we get a point where there's basically the warmest day and the coldest day, there's, there's no change year over year, throughout the year. I call that the depth of zero amplitude, which doesn't really mean anything except that at that point, that's what the temperature is. And then as you go deeper, you start heading towards the center of the earth where you got molten iron and nickel and stuff, right? And so it's hotter, and so the ground has this geothermal gradient, so the deeper you go, the warmer it gets, until, again, you cross that 32 degree line, and now you're out of permafrost and uh, into thawed ground at depth. Now, one of the interesting things here is if the summer air temperature gets a little warmer at the peak of the summer, and if summers are a little longer, you can imagine that that upper right-hand curve is going to kind of shift to the right a little bit, which is to say warmer. And if the winter temperatures are not as cold as they used to be, a little warmer, and the winter's a little bit shorter, the left side of that curve is going to shift to the right a little bit. And so that whole curve is going to shift further to the right. And so, but, but everything else is, going to, is staying the same there. So you can imagine that the geothermal gradient, instead of running out of permafrost here, Maybe it's going to start working its way up and thaw from the bottom up. And similarly, the active layer is going to get deeper. So the permafrost is degrading from the surface and from the bottom. And this temperature, <clears throat> this is depth, the depth of zero amplitude temperature is going, to, is going to work its way further and further. And this whole area that's under the permafrost curve is going to become less. So here is a, uh, a map of permafrost. That's not really right. It's really not a map of permafrost. It's a map of permafrost probability or, or, or permafrost zones. The pink and uh, rose color at the top, that's continuous permafrost. And the, and the takeaway there is, that's mostly north slope, the takeaway there is you go anywhere except maybe under a really big water body, it's going to be permafrost, pretty much a sure thing. The teal down near the coast, uh, is uh, that is essentially permafrost free. There's very essentially no permafrost there. <clears throat> so some people look at this map and say, wow, the teal stuff's no permafrost, everything else is permafrost. Well, that's not really right. The blue, the light blue, that's uh, isolated permafrost, which basically means there could be, but probably not. It's uh, on the order, you know, 10% or less of that is, is frozen. The mauve stuff in the middle, that big area in the interior, Fairbanks, that's discontin discontinuous permafrost. Might be permafrost, might not be. So this doesn't suggest that almost all of the landmass of, of Alaska is permafrost, but more like the probabilities of where it, where it might be. <clears throat> uh, going back to our map of uh, DOT, 
can see that the teal corresponds to the, the no permafrost zone, corresponds pretty closely with our south coast region. They were real excited when they got this little bit of, uh, of uh, YK delta and actually did get some permafrost, but not, not an awful lot. There's actually quite a bit of permafrost in central region, but there isn't a lot of road system excuse me, a lot of road system where there is permafrost, Bethel being exception. Uh, Chief Eddie Thompson Drive is a, in Bethel is a, a notorious permafrost problem. And there's some permafrost on the Glen Highway and the parks as well in central region. But uh, the vast majority of the permafrost in Alaska is in the northern region. The vast majority of Alaska is northern region. And, uh, and the other takeaway here is this is basically telling you about the thermal condition of the ground, the temperature. It doesn't say anything about whether that permafrost is thaw stable or thaw unstable. So don't let anybody show you this map and say, oh my God, all of, all of Alaska is gonna melt. Because number one, it's not all permafrost. Those are probabilities. And number two, a lot of it is places that if it thaws, it won't hurt anything. So, but, but the thaw unstable stuff, the ice rich silt, that is a problem. And, and so why do we care about that anyway? Well. It makes it hard for us to do our job of keeping Alaska moving. <clears throat> if, uh, if you looked at uh, normal soil, you know, bedrock is basically solid, continuous rock. And soil is particles of rock. And they could be silt or sand size, they could be gravel, they could be boulders. But the takeaway is, is that you've got particles of mineral, of rock, of whatever size, and between those, they never nest back the way they, you know, to, to make them 100% solid like they are in bedrock. There's voids, and those voids can be filled with air if it's dry. They can be filled with water if it's saturated. They can be filled with both if it's moist, and that, that's a pretty common case. <clears throat> but, uh, but basically, these particles are touching each other, and then they're the void space. Well, if you were to excavate into ice-rich, uh, ice-rich frozen silt, and, it, and if you did it in the winter time, which would be the right time to do it, uh, <clears throat> you would find that it behaves a lot like rock. It looks like rock. You'd have to drill it and blast it or rip it with a dozer because it's not because the, the ice is binding it together, and, and so when it breaks up, it breaks up into chunks that look an awful lot like rock. But if you looked at it closely enough, you'd see that there's actually, instead of these particles touching each other, they're actually there's too much ice. There's more ice there than there is void space if everything was touching each other, and those particles are sort of floating in a matrix of ice. <clears throat> so if you thaw it out, you look at the, the beaker on the right there, the stuff at the bottom is totally saturated loose silt. It's basically like mud. You, but, but on top of that, there's standing water. Something like 20% of the volume of that beaker is excess water and so if you had 10 feet of this stuff and you thought it, and you, you built a road on it and you thought it, two feet of that is gonna settle out just because of the excess water. But it's gonna settle more than that because this unconsolidated silt, you put a load on it, it's gonna squeeze more water out of that. So if you had 10 foot of the stuff on the right and you thought it, you'd probably see three or four feet of settlement of anything that was built on top of it. Now, that's bad enough, but if all this was it was uniform, if it was equally, had an equal moisture content everywhere, and if it thawed all the same at the same rate, at least maybe your road would all settle at the same pace. And that sometimes happened. But sometimes we have massive ice. And if the, if the silt is, is, is thawing and settling 30%, 40%, how much do you think the massive ice settles? Well, it settles 100%, right? So now you've got differential conditions <clears throat> where it's, it's thawing, the, the settlement is, is not uniform, and, uh, and that gives us that differential settlement. There's a lot of different kinds of ice that, uh, that we can have, different f forms of ice. One that we deal with quite a bit and uh, is really kind of interesting is wedge ice. It's this carrot-shaped uh, structure. It looks carrot-shaped in this view because we're looking at it end on, but this goes back into the page and these, uh, the slide on the bottom, that, uh, that's what we call polygonal ground. And each of these lines, each of these linear structures is an ice wedge intersecting in with other ice wedges. <clears throat> so when you can see this, it's pretty clear. And this is, like I say, very diagnostic of ice wedge country and, and common on the North Slope and, and other places as well. But uh, this one on the left, there was an ice wedge here that formed 
but it got buried by overlying silt. It's, it's windblown silt, less probably, that buried this. And so now you may not see this kind of, you would not see this kind of expression on the surface. And you might not be able to tell at all that there was an ice wedge here. When we were drilling on the Dalton Nine Mile Hill project, we drilled through places where we went through 80 feet or more of pure ice. Uh, this is just a little guy here. Uh, 80 feet of pure ice, and th there was no way of seeing that from the surface. Uh, there's no visible, and, and that happened several times. Um, this po picture here is really famous. That's why I showed it twice. Uh, it has been used for a lot of presentations, and it is including uh, as an example of frost heaving. It's not frost heaving. This is permafrost thaw. In fact, you can almost imagine those ice wedges, that polygonal ground and those ice wedges thawing out. Uh, we see a similar behavior in, in other places, but uh, this happens to be on the Richardson Highway out towards Delta, old, the old Richardson Highway. This section of road is closed, by the way, and, and we didn't build it that way. Uh, <clears throat> uh, here's a place where we built the road, built Dalton Highway over, uh, it's through a valley fill. That's where you build a road from one hilltop to another across a valley, and there's massive ice underneath there, and it's settling due to thaw, settling vertically. It's also creeping downhill, and our maintenance and operations folks have to work on it every year, hauling in a lot of gravel. And yet, right up the road here, you go through a bedrock cut. As you get out of that fill and off the ice into bedrock, that pavement has been there. They, they paved this in 2004, and that pavement is great. It's smooth, and the Original striping is still in place. Uh, this is up by on the Taylor Highway, up by, a little past Chicken. Uh, this is a roughly eight foot thick uh, ice lens. It's not a vertical structure, it's a horizontal structure. <clears throat> it was exposed by placer mining in Lost Chicken Creek. And what you can't tell here is that the road is right up here. And between the ice lens and also just probably ice rich permafrost thawing, it used to settle to the point where our m and folks had to haul in a couple feet of gravel every year for a couple hundred yards stretch to keep the road open. Interestingly, in 2010, we had a lot of flooding up on the Taylor Highway and it, the road washed out here, not necessarily related to the permafrost, but it exposed it. And one of the interesting things here is you can see the old permafrost at depth and the different gravel layers that have been built in up over the years to keep the road in, in place. Bridges tend to do pretty well. We, uh, we tend to, we build bridges on piles unless, unless the ground conditions are really good. And we put those piles pretty deep. They uh, either go to bedrock or they go to thaw stable material into gravel, very dense material. And so the bridges don't move. The approaches on the other hand, uh, not so much. And uh, the guardrail, guardrail is really an interesting thing to look at because you can tell a lot about what's going on in the ground. But you can see this whoop, whoop on either side of the bridge where, uh, where the approaches are settling. This is uh, up on the Dalton Highway. This picture was taken in 2019. The, the embankment was built in 2018. Uh, there's a series of linear sinkholes along the road here. And of course, our maintenance guys are grading this and filling them back in, which is why you don't see so many right there. But uh, the takeaway is it's a linear pattern. And after this photo was taken, another linear pattern of sinkholes uh, opened up in the same general area. If you were to look at this from the air, you'd see the polygonal ground in the area. So what we've got is a road over ice, uh, over ice wedges. And uh, for whatever reason, we and it must have initiated some thawing in those Ah, uh, these shoulder failures on airports on the West Coast are ubiquitous. Uh, I show, uh, this is just three runways, but I could show you many others. Um, what happens here is these, these uh, airports are built pretty well. They're, they're pretty thick. They have foam insulation in them, uh, most of them. And the runway itself, the center of it is thermally stable. But what happens is uh, the the worst thawing occurs on the slope and at the toe of the slope. And so as that toe of the slope and the permafrost underneath it th warm and thaw, the, the slope starts settling down and, and rotating out. So it ends up becoming both this vertical and horizontal motion. And that's what opens up these cracks. And uh, 
So there's, like I say, both a vertical and a horizontal component to that, that motion. Uh, frequently, these, run, these runways are built uh, in flat ground, and so as the toe and the surrounding area right around the toe thaw, they create ponds and standing water. Water is a great way of thawing permafrost. It's a great way of imparting heat energy into the ground. And so that exacerbates the problem and it just it becomes a vicious cycle. Our, our standard policy when we, when we do work on one of these things is to try to fill that pond up and displace the water because that, uh, that does help control things a little bit. But uh, as bad as these are and as ugly as they look, uh, operationally, they're not that serious. The, uh, the you know, the airplanes run on the, the main air, main runway. Then there's this sa flat safety area. So that if they get off of the main runway, <clears throat> they are still on flat ground. If they get so far over here to where they catch a wheel on this thing and flip over and do a ground loop, they were like two more feet from falling off the edge of the embankment and doing a ground loop anyway. So these are not operationally that critical unless and until these cracks start working their way up into the lighting system or start affecting the nav aids, navigational aids. Uh, on the highways, on the other hand, that's a little different story. We don't have a 75 foot wide safety zone, safety area on the highways. And uh, this doesn't look terribly bad. If you got, ran off the road here, you could probably make it to the bottom. The one on the right, that, uh, that shoulder is probably four feet or maybe six feet wide, so that crack is at least four, at least a foot wide. If you uh, caught a tire in that going off the road at 60 miles an hour, there would be boom, 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 boom. Uh, remember the PF and DOT and PF is public facilities, got to have a picture of a building. This is actually not that dramatic. Uh, the, the ground out here is not especially bad. Uh, and the embankment was built pretty well, but it was built in 1983, and over the years it has settled. And you can see the the, the bow in the back of in the in the roof of that building. So, what causes permafrost to thaw? The single biggest thing, the single best thing you can do if you want to do thaw permafrost, is to do what DOT does: build something on it. <clears throat> uh, construction disur disturbance, particularly using conventional techniques, is the single worst thing we can do. I mean, first thing you do is you cut down the trees that are providing shade in the summertime, right? And then you strip off the moss and the vegetation, which is what is insulating it in the summertime to keep that, uh, that summer heat out. And yeah, you maybe make a low spot so that you can collect water in pond water. We already talked about this. Water's got a lot of specific heat and uh, it's, a, it's a great way to impart heat energy into permafrost and thought. It was, we'll talk about that a little more later. You replace the organic soil with gravel. Maybe you do it in the summertime. You probably do it in the summertime if you're using you know, conventional techniques. So while you're doing all these not so good things for the long term, you're also exposing the ground to all the solar radiation and the warm summer air temperature. Then if you really want to finish it off, you paint it black by putting asphalt on top of it so it can collect solar energy. <clears throat> so uh, the, the, the takeaway here is that the impact of construction, particularly if it's, if it's poorly, poorly done and poorly coordinated, can be order of magnitude more significant than the air temperature raising by, by a degree or two. Still, air temperature does matter. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and you can upset the, uh, the apple cart, particularly permafrost that is in, in this warm zone, uh, this discontinuous zone around Fairbanks, and is sort of in this quasi-equilibrium state. Uh, I promised some discussion about climate change. I'm not a climatologist. I'm an engineer, and I know a little bit about permafrost and infrastructure. I know a little bit about climate, though, and I, I'm, a couple of takeaways here. Each of, these, each of these dots represents the annual temperature for a given year in Fairbanks from 1930 to 2019. So it's 90 years of record, right? A uh, couple key takeaways here. The red, the red dots represent the 10 warmest years uh, during that 90-year record. And nine of those 10 occurred since 1976. And the other one occurred in 1940, which is actually significant. Let's keep that in mind. The blue dots represent the 10 coldest years. And sorry, Rick, I think this one's supposed to be blue too. Uh, so the seven, seven of the 10 coldest years on record occurred between 1944 and 1976. 
Then this blue curve, this uh, smooth average curve, shows this trend sort of uh, doing a curve, re uh, curve regression. This is similar data here. Now this is Alaska statewide data, not Fairbanks. They're, they're very similar. The, the patterns are extremely similar, but it's not exactly the same thing from 1926 to 2019, which is uh, roughly the same period of time, 90 some years. And this figure on the bottom is uh, the Pacific De Decadal Oscillation. I had to stretch it to make those scales match and uh, truncate it because the record goes back further for the, P for the PDO, Pacific Decadal Oscillation. But the takeaway PDO is sort of like a decades-long El Nino or La Nina trend. <clears throat> and if you look at this, somewhere around 1944, 46, something like that, we went into a substantial negative, El Nino, uh, negative PDO uh, index. And at the same time, we went into a anomalously low, below 26 degree annual state temperature. And even and, and if you look at even the, the places where, where there's high spots, they match high spots in the PDO. Similarly, uh, prior to that 1944 period, uh, you've still got this, these same patterns and, uh, and this generally warm trend. In 1976, something pretty radical happened. <clears throat> uh, there was a, it, it's a step function. The temperature, the average temperatures jumped up several degrees and so did the, the, so did the PDO. And again, you can even see the, the localized differences, but the general trend was high for the PDO and for the uh, annual, te annual temperatures. So some of us were thinking, hey, somewhere around 2000, 2005, something like that, the PDO ought to switch back and everything ought to cool off again. Well, sure enough, the PDO did go back down, the, the general trend, but the temperatures didn't go down. Uh, in fact, maybe they went up a little bit. <clears throat> and so that, this is some of the warming temper warmer temperatures that those of us who have been here for a while remember the difference between. Then in 2014, the PDO went up and the temperature spiked up again. So I'm not saying this up, upward trend isn't real. It is, but it's not this nice smooth curve or, or linear trend. There's a stepwise function in it and a lot of it's controlled by the temperature of the Pacific Ocean. <clears throat> so engineering consequences of building on ice-rich permafrost and then having it warm up and thaw. The, uh, probably the single most common and dramatic uh, observation is this vertical settlement, particularly when it's differential settlement. Uh, if you drive out the uh, drive out the Steese Highway from time to time, you'll see m &O having to fill in the, the roller coasters on the Steese Highway. There's places out there where the asphalt's probably 15 feet thick. Uh, <clears throat> and that's due to that ice, whether it's excess ice in the frozen silt or massive ice thawing and leaving a void in the, in the ground, the road simply settling down. After the thaw occurs, you can still have additional settling as that previously ice-rich material consolidates. We talked already a little bit about shoulder rotation. That's where the toe of slope differentially settles, thaws and settles, and uh, the slope rotates out and, and creates those cracking. That thawed ice-rich silt, as it thaws and drains, has, as it, before it drains in particular, as it's saturated, has essentially no bearing capacity. It's like mud, it's like soup. And so if it's contained, constrained in the ground, that's when you, we get this vertical settlement. But if there's somewhere for it to go, it's kind of like building a road on a tube of toothpaste. You know, the volume doesn't change, but where you, where you squeeze it, it squishes somewhere else. And so you can have that, that kind of issue, and that can lead to this lateral spreading where the road is literally literally spreading out wider as it sort of squeezes out towards the sides. And you, you'll see that manifested sometimes as <clears throat> a longitudinal cracking, you know, in the middle of the road. Um, ice and really ice-rich silt can creep. That's like a sort of a slow motion plastic flow. Uh, and so if you build something on a slope with ice in it, that ice just literally deforms slowly over time and you can have that creep motion. 
And then the other thing is bedrock. I said bedrock doesn't care whether it's frozen or not, and that's true from the standpoint of settlement. But if you cut into it and you're, you've, got, you've got a steep slope and the bedrock is crummy, it's broken, fractured, and, or it's uh, highly weathered, and it's got moisture in it that's frozen, and that's what's holding it together, well, if what's holding it together is the ice binding it and it thaws, well, now you've got nothing holding it together. And that is a, a big element of what's happening on the Denali Park Road and the pretty rock slide. <clears throat> so what does DOT do about it when we need to build on, on permafrost? First thing we do if we can is we try to avoid it. That's, uh, that's a great strategy, but it's frequently not possible. We can try to remove it, a couple ways of removing it. Um, we've spent a lot of effort and time and, and have been pretty effective, pretty effective at keeping it frozen. But that's becoming harder and harder because as we'll discuss, it really uh, is contingent on temperature. <clears throat> and the last uh, technique we use, and this may sound stupid, but it's actually a really good strategy for some facilities some of the time, is just build, build the road the way you would build it anywhere else and live with the consequences and accept that uh, you're going to have to do stuff with it. That's basically how the Dalton Highway was built and it has uh, performed its function pretty well for a long time. <clears throat> Every strategy has its own challenges and has its own costs. <clears throat> Some of the problems with these different strategies or the, the challenges with these strategies is that we don't build a lot of new roads. We do occasionally, but most of the roads we have that we work on, we're trying to maintain the roads we've got. And some of the things we sometimes try to do is improve the geometry. We try to flatten some of the hills or flatten out, the, widen some of the curves to uh, improve the geometric standards. So you take a road like the Dalton Highway, it was built in the 70s, it's, it's pushing 50 years old now, and where it has been for a long time, yeah, it's been a high maintenance road, but in a lot of places, it's starting to, it's, it's, the, the maintenance is slowing down in some respects because it has thawed to the depth where it's not uh, progressing as fast as it did originally. So now you go and move the road over to the side to widen a curve or you cut the ground down closer to the permafrost, you reset the clock and you start reinitiating those problems. Airports, we do occasionally build new airports. And, uh, and we do try as much as we can to put them on the best foundations we can, but there's a lot of constraints on airports. There's airspace constraints, so you can't put them in some, to, some topography, and uh, <clears throat> airports uh, have to be close enough to the village that they're supporting to be practical, and a lot of times where they are, there just aren't really good alternatives. Part of being able to avoid permafrost means you gotta find out where it is and where it isn't, and uh, and we're using some new techniques to do that. Traditionally, we use drilling. Drilling is a great way to know what's going on at a given location, at a specific point. You drill a vertical hole and you know an awful lot about the ground right there. And if that ground is, is homogeneous and doesn't change between that and the next hole, then that's great. You know an awful lot about the ground there. But with, my, with massive ice in particular and with varying ice contents, what you might find in one hole you go 10 feet and it could be an entirely different condition. So what we've been doing lately is using geophysics to, uh, to help fill in the gaps and also to help us target our drilling more effectively. Uh, what you see over here on this right, this is a, a, a product called OMAPPER and this is uh, the Coal Regions <coughs> Research and Engineering Laboratory doing this work for us on the Dalton Highway. This is a kind of the output on the bottom. We have recently acquired the same kind of equipment ourselves and we're able to do this ourselves. Uh, the, the significant thing here is that ice is uh, highly resistive. This is an electro, electro resistivity method and ice is very resistive and so what these hot colors down there represent, in fact they are ice and uh, ice rich permafrost is pretty high resistivity and then uh, other materials have different properties. <clears throat> One of our strategies is to remove permafrost and if the ground, if the bad permafrost is really bad, but it's really shallow, and there's something thaw stable underneath it, bedrock or gravel, or, or even permafrost that just isn't as nearly as ice rich, removing the really bad stuff and replacing it can be a good strategy. But it's got its own challenges. You've got this ice rich stuff that you gotta get rid of, and 
you need to do it in the winter time because if you do it in the summertime, it just turns into a big sloppy mess. So you need to do it in the winter time. Then you've got to replace that with thaw stable fill, gravel or something, which you don't really want to do in the winter time. But you want to fill the hole back up before it starts thawing out. So you kind of have to. Uh, it makes it becomes a, a fairly expensive proposition because there's a lot of excavation. Then there's a lot of material you got to bring back. It's really whether it's viable or not really depends on the thickness of the bad permafrost, the unstable ice-rich permafrost, the availability of thaw-stable fill to backfill it, and, uh, and a place basically to put that stuff. Uh, another strategy that we have not used very much, but that we actually are working on a research project with uh, Transport Canada and the University of Laval, is, uh, is the idea of pre-thawing, where you deliberately thaw the permafrost in advance of a project, let it thaw out, uh, probably surcharge it to try to squeeze out that extra moisture and basically prepare the ground before you build a road or a facility there. Uh, like I say, it's something we're looking at. It's got its own challenges. Uh, number one is the sediment control. Frequently when ice-rich permafrost thaws, it, it, it oozes. It makes a, a sloppy mess and there are sediment control issues. Uh, and the other thing is the construction sequence timing. It takes a long time for this to happen. And we're talking, you know, years perhaps, uh, unless you actively, if you do a natural thawing, it takes years for this to take place. And our uh, highway construction sequence doesn't lend itself very well to working on something for a little while, forgetting about it for 10 years, and then coming back and building something later. Um, so another strategy that we have used with pretty good success is this, the keep it frozen strategy. And one of the coolest things, this is brilliant, is a thermosiphon. And we use these routinely for building foundations, particularly on the North Slope. That's where this is in Dead Horse. Um, the way these work is essentially you've got a pipe in the ground. It's filled with a compressed working fluid, ammonia, carbon dioxide. In the wintertime, that permafrost cold as it is, it's, but it's, it's relatively warm compared to the air temperature. Maybe the permafrost on the north slope is 25 above, maybe the air temperature is 25 below. So in the winter time, the relatively warm permafrost boils this compressed liquefied uh, working fluid into a, into a vapor. Vapors are light, so they go up, the, up this tube, up the pipe, into this condenser. The condenser is colder because it's up in the natural air at 25 below or whatever it is sheds that heat to the air, cools the vapor into a liquid, condensing it. The liquids are heavy, so they sink back down here, and you get this internal cycle that is working on gravity and phase change, and it's super effective at extracting heat. The Trans-Alaska Pipeline has thousands of these things in the vertical support members that hold the pipeline up off the ground when it goes over permafrost. <clears throat> They're very effective. They're expensive. And uh, so we use them on buildings which have a high cost per square foot, high unit cost. Uh, you can't use them on airports because uh, you don't want planes crashing into them. And they're kind of squirrely on highways too because they're, they're in the clear zone and uh, there's maintenance issues associated with snow plowing and things like that. But, uh, but they do work. A similar concept <clears throat> that we've been using with, uh, with pretty good effect is the idea of an ACE embankment or a uh, ACE uh, ventilated shoulder treatment. And I, I bring your attention to this uh, web link here. That is the brand new newsletter. It's brand new in June, by the way, not in August, uh, for the research and DOT and PF's research and T2 uh, newsletter. It's got a great article on how these uh, systems work and the research that we've been working on trying to optimize them and make them more cost effective. The takeaway is in a true ACE embankment you've got this this area you're trying to keep cold, permafrost, maybe warm permafrost in Fairbanks. You've got this uh, driving surface, pavement on top, that you try to make as thin as possible. So in the wintertime this pavement surface, you know, you're plowing the snow off of it, it's exposed to the air, this gets pretty doggone cold. It gets pretty close to air temperature at the top and uh, so maybe this, uh, the, the air at the very top of this uh, permeable rock, this coarse permeable rock, is uh, say 
10, 10 below zero. Down here, the ground is 31 degrees, right? Because it's uh, warm permafrost. So relatively speaking, this air down here is warmer than the air on top. Well, warm air is lighter than cold air, so this warm air on the, top, on the bottom tries to climb up through this porous rock to this ground surface where it cools off. Now it's cold air, so it sinks back down, and we get these convection cells in, in, within the embankment, and so you get a net cooling effect, effect in the wintertime, and then in the summertime, the warm air is on top, the cold air is on the bottom, nothing really happens, except that this rock makes a pretty good insulator, better insulator than a gravel embankment. And so year over year, just like the thermosiphons, there's no phase change taking place here. It's just air as a, as a working medium, but you're extracting heat. Uh, the other technique here, the other strategy, is uh, these sh ace shoulders, these ventilated shoulders. And in those cases, all you're doing is building a regular embankment, maybe with some insulation in it, and then putting this rock treatment, this porous rock treatment on the shoulders so that in the wintertime, cold air can penetrate that rock and the relatively a warm embankment compared to the air temperature warms it and you get this chimney effect that uh, promotes circulation and extracts heat. And this is actually quite effective and uh, super cools the toe of the embankment, which ultimately helps freeze back everything. Remember, the toe is the part that, freeze, that tends to thaw the most in the summertime. So this is a way of freezing it back more in the wintertime. And uh, we have research that is showing that this is very effective. Another technique to keep it frozen, maybe, <coughs> is uh, using foam insulation. Foam insulation is not magic, and it doesn't make things cold. It, it uh, retards heat transfer, and it's just, just like an ice chest. If you had two growlers of beer, and you put one in an ice chest, and you put one in a milk crate, and you threw them in the back of your truck in the summertime, which one's going to heat up first? One in the milk crate, right? Because the insulation of that cooler keeps that beer colder, longer. But now, you do the same exact thing in the wintertime, and you want to get home from the get home from the brewery before anything freezes, which one's going to freeze first? Well, the one in the milk crate's going to freeze too, because that cooler is keeping the, keeping the heat that's in the beer from ex expanding, ex extending into the uh, outside air temperature. In the beer case, the cooler works both ways. But in permafrost, what we really want to do is to make it cold in the wintertime and keep the heat out of it in the summertime. And insulation, it's a double-edged sword. It works both ways. Uh, up on the north slope where things are cold, insulation still works. It works pretty well because the winter is long enough and cold enough to freeze more than it thaws in the summertime. And so what that insulation does <clears throat> is just keeps that depth of, depth of thaw out of the ground in the wintertime, in the summertime. In the interior, on the other hand, where things are thaw unstable or perhaps degrading already, I mean, 2019, we were above, above freezing, right? In Fairbanks. Uh, what this does is it slows the rate of thaw, but it also kind of prolongs the misery. So you're ex experiencing that longer time. And again, I've, I've got another uh, diagram of the trumpet curve. As you, you know, as you can imagine, as, uh, as this trumpet curve moves, moves to, the, uh, to the right, this is going to continue, going to work less and less. And uh, the time of construction is really critical with insulation, if you're going to use it at all. <clears throat> the ideal time to, to build is in the springtime. You've got maximum frost penetration from the winter, and everything is as cold as it's going to get. So if you excavate quickly, put your insulation down, and backfill on top of it quickly, right around breakup, ideally, then you're trapping the coldest of the coldest conditions in the ground. You're, you're over in this area here. And so, uh, like I say, that's, that's the best scenario. A bad scenario is to do it in the fall. Then you're doing the exact opposite. You are, uh, you're, you're trapping in all the summer heating and you're putting the insulation on it, so you've sort of shifted that curve to the right. But the worst thing you can do is to excavate in the spring and then walk away. Then come back in the fall and then insulate it. Because then you've done, done both. You've ex not only have you uh, you've accelerated all that thaw. <clears throat> One of the things we do at DOT is thermal modeling. That's how we determine uh, what the stability of an embankment is going to be. 
it's challenging. We've been doing it for many decades. We used to use a, a one-dimensional DOS-based program. Anybody remember DOS? Uh, but uh, it worked actually quite well, but it was a one-dimensional program, so it looked at thawing in a vertical manner. And that actually works quite well in the middle of an embankment or the center of a runway. But as we've seen, the toe of the embankment is really frequently the more critical part. And so we now use a two-dimensional finite element program called temp slash W that uh, allows us to model temperatures with different scenarios. Uh, and it's tricky. Um, there's, a, there's a question of what material inputs you should use. And again, if everything is really homogeneous and you know exactly what, is, what the conditions are, that's great. But frequently, if you've got ice wedges and then ice rich soil and then ice poor soil, you know, which one do you model? Uh, it's tricky. Modeling for water is very tricky. Water is, uh, has a high degree of, of thawing capa capacity. We do have a research project looking into that too. Um, the temperatures are actually one of the things we have a moderately good control over. And we have been using the IPCC RCP 8.5 uh, models that we get through us through SNAP up at the university. That's our, our current po protocol for modeling into the future. We started out using the 6.0 because it was sort of the middle of the road model. But as it turns out, the 8.5 model is actually seems to be tracking pretty well with uh, what we're actually observing in Alaska. There's a couple philosophical questions about thermal modeling too and, and, and design in general. The design life of a, of a project of a piece of infrastructure is it's it that's that's how you design a, a project and and historically we've used maybe a 30-year design life for roads but that's really looking at the needs the the capacity needs whether you need to add another line another lane or when you're going to have to rehabilitate the pavement or something like that it's really not the idea that well it's thermally stable for 30 years and then after that it's going to start falling apart and the maintenance uh, requirements are going to go up exponentially um, if you were to try to design a, a road or an airport based on the current RCP 8.5 modeling for, to be stable in the year, say, 2100, it would probably be cost, just wouldn't be cost feasible to do that. And we don't. But what that design life ought to be, that's, a, like I say, sort of a philosophical question. And it really comes down more to policy than to engineering. Another question is what constitutes an acceptable design? If it thaws and you get some settlement on the shoulder, is that okay? Yeah, I think it probably is, at least on those airports where it doesn't affect the operational activity. Um, on a low volume road, road to Tana, for example, is a pioneer road. Well, we can tolerate uh, a fair amount of, of misbehaving in that road. Uh, on the Parks Highway, Mitchell Expressway, no, not so much. We don't want, we don't want settlement there. So it really is, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting point to debate. Uh, our final strategy is just to build the way we would normally build. I can say it's worked pretty well on the Dalton Highway. <clears throat> it's a cheaper way to build it in the first place, usually. Uh, but you can anticipate more work required in the future. Uh, and when you do this, you kind of have to consider what is M&O going to need to do that. You know, if you've got an asphalt paved road and it starts falling apart, you got to fix it with asphalt. Well, that's a problem, and that's, that's maybe that's a good strategy in Fairbanks, where you've got asphalt plants in the summertime. But uh, up on the Dalton Highway, where you're 400, 500 miles away from the closest asphalt plant, uh, that could be a real, real challenge. Gravel surfaces, I'm a big fan of gravel roads for a lot of facilities. They can be maintained with grading, and they may require a fair amount of maintenance, but it's something that is... Uh, it's, it's pretty doable, and, and when something does settle to the point where it needs to be filled in, you can haul in gravel, uh, which is something that our maintenance and operations folks do anyway. I've got a couple interesting pictures here. The one, on the, the one on the left here is a section of the Richardson Highway where there's about six feet of asphalt where it has settled, m and has filled it in, settled and filled it in, probably not uniformly over the years, <clears throat> but, uh, but it's continuous asphalt. On the right, on the other hand, I'm sorry, that's the Parks Highway. On the right, on the other hand, is uh, an area where it probably was not super ice rich and it probably was pretty uniform and settled uniformly because we've got these, this layer of the original embankment and asphalt pavement, another layer of gravel and asphalt, more gravel, another layer of asphalt, another layer of gravel, and, and the current layer of asphalt. So, uh, so that's one strategy there. Uh, 
just to keep building it up when it starts getting too low, if everything settles uniformly, which doesn't always happen. Oh, so some final thoughts. Um, it is reasonable to expect that our maintenance is going to get increase. I've talked to a number of our DOT superintendents and they have told me anecdotally, and they've gotten numbers to show it too, that over the last oh, 10 or 15 years, the amount of effort, the frequency of the repairs, the extent of the repairs has gone up. Um, and they attribute this to the warmer temperatures that we've all experienced over the, you know, over the last uh, oh, 10, 20, 30 years. Um, I say generally increase. There's going to be some places where the maintenance actually goes down. As the permafrost thaws and, and, and drains and stabilizes in those isolated permafrost areas, uh, things may actually get better. But there's more to go, there's more areas that can get worse than there are areas that are going to get better anytime soon. These boundaries of where discontinuous permafrost and isolated permafrost are going to tend to move north. Uh, and the percentages are likely to change. And that discontinuous permafrost, if it's currently, say, 50-50, maybe it'll be 30%, 70%. Uh, and those isolated areas are going to tend to dry up and, and, and go away. The keep it frozen strategies all rely on winter uh, to, to freeze things back. The, the takeaway on all these strategies is you're counting on enough freezing taking place to you drive the thermosiphons to freeze the ground back or to make the ACE convection cells work or the shoulders work or even where you're using insulation to hopefully have a net freezing effect, <clears throat> like I say, on the north slope. And the less winter we have and the more summer we have, the less effective these techniques are going to be. And the final parting shot is permafrost is not a new problem. I'll show you the picture from 1942 of the Alaska Highway, but it is a problem that's getting worse. Thank you. <laughs> okay, this is the part of the show where normally I would ask for questions and audience questions and do a little Q and A. Um, uh, you over there, the imaginary person in the chair at the end of the table. What was? It? Well, okay, I'll repeat the uh, question for the audience. <clears throat> the, uh, the question was on the North Slope. Uh, do you drive piles to bedrock or gravel? I thought permafrost was really deep up there. Um, <clears throat> the answer is that that is correct. The standard procedure for driving piles for bridges on the north slope is to bore holes for the piles, place those piles, and then pour a water sand slurry around them and let them freeze back. Works really well because the permafrost is cold enough that that sand will drain and freeze and you get the strength that you need in your piles. Now, someday, if the warming trends continue indefinitely, someday that permafrost is going to warm and eventually thaw. And then what's going to happen? That's all I got.